being a surgeon fit with my personality. There's a problem, you solve it, and you try to find a solution very quickly, hopefully, and, and uh, it's very cut and dry, you know, no pun intended. Minimally invasive surgery just took it to another level and requires skill sets that are very difficult to acquire and require things like uh, being able to place yourself in a three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional screen. One thing I like about doing the surgery is that uh, it's essentially new almost every day I come into work. The technology came out 11 years ago and has been improving ever since then so that patients don't have as much trauma, pain, and recover a lot faster. Hi, Raj, I guess we're getting filmed. <laughs> How you doing? Hi, doctor. Very well. Yeah. So you know what the plan is, right? We're going to uh, we're going to attempt one kidney first, and we're going to do the left side first. Okay? Okay. This patient has had a progressive renal failure uh, from diabetes. As a result, he has had a transplant uh, many years ago. His disease kidneys were left in initially because most patients don't have problems afterwards. So at the end of the day, if you don't have to do any surgery, you prefer not to have to. Okay, I'll see you in a few minutes, all right? Again, thanks, Doug. Everything else has been exhausted. This is now like the procedure that we are looking for to resolve my actual medical problem. Uh, it's been hypertension. It's been running at a rather uncontrolled rate. So the belief is my own um, kidneys are actually the cause of this. The attempt here is to remove both kidneys and hopefully restore some balance in his blood pressure. And uh, that's usually fairly effective. But now we've done laparoscopic nephrectomies on one side, but uh, it's never really been done before on both sides. In fact, I only know of one other case worldwide where they've done two simultaneously. While I'm waiting to get started as the anesthetist is putting the patient to sleep, I usually tend to chill out, sit in the hallway, talk to whoever's in the hallway, or go into the next room and disturb the other surgeon doing his operation. I've got a terrible allergy to all the soaps that are used for scrubs, and I basically can't use brushes or else my hands will start to fall apart. All right, so what do we got here? We got that hooked up, that hooked up. Can we turn off the lights? And move this over. Swing that over. There you go. Great. Hot water pools. This uh, laparoscope or lens attached to a microchip camera, and that will allow us to see essentially the operative field, which is on the screen rather than actually on the patient. Through the procedure, we'll constantly be shifting his position so that we can move things out of the way since we can't get our hands in there to do the same thing. The colon is here, and the kidney lies behind the colon and the spleen, and so we have to basically get those organs out of the way in order to visualize the kidney. Thank you. Are you comfortable now, Ken? Unbelievably comfortable. Good. As long as uh, the assistant is comfortable, we don't care if the surgeon is dying, right? That's right. <laughs> this is the spleen right over here. He has more than the usual amount of fat here, primarily because he's been on steroids for so long. And as a result, the normal anatomical structures are not as clear. Give me a clinch, please. artery is probably in this clump of fat, and I really just need to dissect a little bit more. But I think we're making progress. It's just not exactly the 100-yard dash. But the nurses will tell you, here I'm very, very patient. Won't you, ladies? <laughs> That's the artery. That's the vein, this little bluish thing. And you can't see it very well, primarily because it's surrounded by fat. All right, give me a big clip. I'm going to clip this. We've isolated the artery. That should control the blood flow and any potential problems with bleeding as we continue the dissection and go after the renal vein. That's it. That's the final clip on the renal vein. 
we'll now know if uh, we've got complete control because I'm just going to cut it. So far, so good. There you see the inside of the renal vein. It's been totally transected. There's the artery. And there's Clip the artery down. down here with the clips on. So the kidney's major blood supply and drainage have all been disconnected at this point. Staples ready? We've gotten to the stage where I'm going to now transect the ureter, which is the last attachment that the kidney has. And this will allow me to lift the kidney up. So you can see the staple is going across the ureter. That's it. You just fire it through. It's like a stapler, and it cuts at the same time. And that's it. OK, a few more millimeters. We should be ready in a little while to bag it, if you will, and remove it. Ziploc freezer bags. They're perfect size, perfect strength. They work great. And we're able to put all our specimens in these. I need to see the bag more than the, the kidney. Stop there, yeah. Uh, we put it in a bag and then we chop it up in the bag in order to uh, make sure that we don't lose the specimen. Let's grab the corner. OK? Mm -hmm. All right, follow me. Can we have the room lights, please? Perfect. You can chop it up. Careful not to hit the bag. This is my favorite part of the whole operation, essentially. It's the reward. Being able to take this entire kidney out of this small little hole. I love this. There we are. Perfect. Can I have a sponge or a green towel? And that's it. Essentially, we've done a nephrectomy through an incision that's two centimeters in length. And we're going to close these up and do the opposite side. Mm -hmm. So the other side is a carbon copy of this side. The approach is similar. There are some different structures we have to deal with. The liver more than anything else. So this is the way we sponge when we do it laparoscopically. We shove a little tiny sponge in there and we sort of play with it like chopsticks. Grab the yellow and lift up straight up. That's it. The right kidney has been completely detached. This side went a lot faster than the left side, primarily because the kidney was uh, easily found, surrounded with much less fat. These uh, specimens should go separately yeah. in case they find any inadvertent tumors. Perfect. So if all goes well, this gentleman should be able to go home in a couple of days. Had he had it done the routine way, he would have been here well into next week and possibly longer. get up any time between 5 or 5.30 and uh, drive into work uh, to get in the office between 6 and 6.30. I was a surgeon before I got married, and, uh, and my kids, uh, they grew up with it. I don't think that they've known anything different. Any activities that I do will be on the weekends with my family, so it's my family or it's my work. I never had a calling to be a physician. I was very much into athletics. And one of my teammates uh, had bet me 100 bucks that I couldn't get into medical school. And that's really essentially how it started. I'll have a uh, regular uh, blend. Regular blend? Yeah. I'll 
Apart from having my cup of coffee, I don't have any routines at all. If I don't have my cup of coffee, then my day starts off on the wrong foot. My favorite part uh, about my job really is the day I come in at seven in the morning, I walk into the operating room and uh, throw away the key and don't get out again until six o'clock at night. This is a team effort and I am nothing without my scrub nurses and I am nothing without the anesthetists. So at the end of the day, any surgeon who walks into an operating room and thinks that the buck stops with him and he's uh, everything to that patient, he's going in it with the wrong attitude. That patient's life is as much dependent on the nurses doing their job as it is on the anesthetist, as it is on the surgeon. Basically, your problem, as you are aware, is that the valve between the esophagus and the stomach is very, very tight. It essentially doesn't relax, and so every time you swallow, it acts like a resistance to swallowing. Right. Initially, I mean, it's something that you don't really notice an awful lot because you just notice a certain discomfort, you know, in your, in your esophagus, a certain discomfort as you're trying to swallow food, and you, you don't really kind of associate that with any kind of serious difficulty. Um, later on, it started to become progressively more and more intrusive on my ability to eat. In normal people, when they swallow, the muscle contracts and pushes food down. In your case, uh, the, um, the muscle itself uh, just fails to relax and it becomes essentially an area of high resistance to food going by. This is the muscle layer. You can see it, it's spread wide open. Normally this covers the entire esophagus, which is this part here. We cut the muscle surrounding the esophagus. Uh, now during the operation, we're going to have somebody do a gastroscopy. In other words, put a scope and a camera down your esophagus and they'll be seeing this very tight sort of muscle area. And as we cut these fibers, eventually what'll happen is it'll just suddenly pop open. And when that happens, that means we've gone far enough and that's when we stop the operation. Uh, so that's basically the operation and that's what the end product will look like for you. By cutting this muscle, you'll be able to swallow almost instantaneously without any problem. We'll give you what's called the uh, St. Michael's donut test. So if you can swallow a donut the next day, uh, you'll be able to go home uh, that afternoon or that midday, okay? Well, are, are there any types of risks that I should be aware of? The main risk from the operation itself will be, as we're making this cut, occasionally there can be a perforation here or here. Uh, we often treat that by just simply stitching it. And then what I'll do on occasion is take a small patch of stomach and just bring it up and cover it up so that it acts as a buttress and seals it. Any other questions? No, I, I think that's good. I'm ready to, to get this done and, okay. and quite frankly, get back on the road to being, uh, being better. Okay, well, I'll see you in three days, is Absolutely. it? Four days, yeah. and we'll get you Monday. fixed up, hopefully, Thanks and uh, get you on your way. All right, okay, thank bye. You. And this gentleman is primary condition, which is achalasia, prevents relaxation of the muscle fibers in the lower part of the esophagus. So every time he swallows, he's got resistance, and over time, that gets progressively worse. I'm certainly hoping that the operating team is a lot more ready than me. I had a little reminder this morning that it's time to go in and get this done when I had another attack this morning around 5 a.m., so it's good time. I'm just kind of looking forward to getting through it. Okay, so, local. Probably right there is fine. Okay, make sure everything is tight. Good. All right, let me see now down here. Have a right tech. This is the liver that we lift up, and that exposes the abdominal portion of the esophagus. This is just some fatty tissue on the front of the uh, esophagus. I have to clear it off in order to visualize the esophagus well. 
The esophagus is a muscular tube that basically contracts when you swallow and it propels food down your throat, essentially, into your stomach. During the operation, we're going to cut the muscle surrounding the esophagus. We have to strip it off completely so that the, the two edges of the muscle don't flop back together again and heal, because then the same problem will recur. <laughs> All right, it was way too much laughing back there. <clears throat> there we go. See how stuck that is? You can see the muscle fibers running longitudinally here. And... All right. <clears throat> so down here first, we still got some clearance to do right here. Yeah. You have to be very careful as you're dissecting here. If you go too shallow, then you'll not cut the muscle enough. And if you go too deep, you might end up perforating the esophagus, which occasionally happens. In... See, that's very stuck there. I'm really reluctant to push the envelope up there. I am a better open surgeon now that I've been doing minimally invasive surgery than I ever was before I started, primarily because I have seen the anatomy from a variety of angles with a high degree of detail that we never saw with open surgery. That's 50% there. Everybody agree? Yep. And now I'm going to have our gastroenterologist colleagues come in and scope the patient from above. Uh, that way they can tell me when that valve relaxes as I'm cutting the fibers. And once that's done, I know that I'm finished. There's no typical week in my life, at least in my professional life, where a trauma center, when you're on call, you essentially don't sleep. Hmm. Are you in now? Yeah, I'm in the stomach. So it went in pretty easy. Back yeah. up again? Come back out again? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, it's not that, it's not tight here. There's the light there. And that's the G junction right there. All right. But stay where you are, okay. and I'll continue cutting the muscle fibers until you see it open up. Okay. Right? More. I may take a couple more fibers right here. This area right here is tight. I'm, I'm well, okay, of, stop. I'm kind of distorting this. That's better. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm perfect. It's not paper. Okay, you can back out. I can back up? Yep, I slowly. And watch everything as you back out. Yeah. That looks good. Okay. Okay, so we're almost finished at this point. Now, at the end of the operation, what we essentially have is all the muscle fibers are gone. The inner lining of the esophagus has been cut just short of the stomach. But essentially, this is it for the operation. And we're now just going to decompress the stomach, and this patient can go back to the recovery room. How are you doing? Doing much better. I guess we'll try and see how you swallow and see how it feels. So did we try it this morning? Yeah, I've been uh, I've been drinking liquids and things okay, like that. So it's let's, been working uh, out very well. Let's have you try and eat some uh, donut here, uh, and if we... you can do that, then I'll send you on your way. All right. That's incentive enough. You <laughs> must have got this one from the uh, hospital cafeteria. Yeah, I wasn't in charge of the donut. I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, I'll give it a try. Now remember, you don't get any prizes for swallowing it down the hole, so chew it well and then take it down. You shouldn't have any more problems with eating. Now, your esophagus, as I explained, is never gonna work 100%, because over the course of four or five years, it's been damaged to some degree. But the fact that we've been able to remove the resistance to your swallowing will make it feel normal, and you'll be able to eat no more normal food and regular-sized meals. That's great. Okay. That's How did great. that go down? That actually, that was great. Was it? Yeah, it went down Good. very well. That was so super. As far as I'm concerned, yeah, you can go. Great job. All right, Thanks call my much, office doctor. and I'll uh, see you in about a week or two. Sounds good. Okay. Thank bye you bye very then. much, Doctor Vivas.
From now on, I think Mr. Ball's swallowing will continue to improve. He's obviously able to eat solid food with no difficulty, and I expect that over the course of the next week or two, he'll be eating more like a regular individual and be able to eat a full-size meal without having to worry about constant pain every time he swallows. So uh, barring any unforeseen problems, I think that he's uh, going to be well for the rest of his life. It's a relief. Yeah. Well, I know we're going to have to do better than a donut. I think so. <laughs> you probably take it for granted all the time when you swallow, and you don't realize, you know, that for me, it, it just always got stuck and would never go any further. So it was really, that was really great. Hello. I like it, doing my rounds and seeing patients, talking to them just to see how they're doing, get their reaction on how they feel. I like seeing the, the rapid recovery, which they often have and also the look of amazement in their eyes, because they're surprised. So, uh, and it would be a lot nicer for you just to kick back and watch TV at home than sitting here in this uh, grungy old room, right? OK, I'll see you tomorrow. Everybody's stereotypical idea of a surgeon, which is sort of an intense, driven individual who makes black and white decisions, to some degree, even though that's a caricature, applies. You have to be able to make uh, decisions, uh, even under difficult circumstances, and you have to be able to carry those decisions out without second-guessing yourself, because when you second-guess yourself, then that's when mistakes are made. I basically do what I do because I enjoy what I do, and I like doing it well. Preferably, if I had my way, I'd do it every single day and nothing else. <laughs>